Hey, welcome back. I am hanging out with a fascinating individual today. Uh, one of the most interesting histories I've read in a while, and I hang out with some pretty cool people. Uh, Larry Brilliant is a medical doctor, uh, and he is a lot more. Uh, he has uh, done his tour, uh, traveled the world, took an Eastern spiritual journey, hung out with the likes of pretty much everybody, uh, and uh, has been uh, tasked um, probably from above with uh, really kind of getting involved in some of the big diseases that have plagued humanity. Uh, and uh, when such said task showed up, he drew his sword and he charged. So this is a, this is a, a fascinating individual, an articula art articulate and awesome uh, man, and I'm really happy to be hanging out with you here. Larry, pleasure, pleasure to have you here. Thank you for welcoming me. I, I appreciate the kind words there. Exaggerated, but I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I exaggerated a single thing here, man. Like you've been, you've been, <laughs> you've been doing it, and you're humble. So good for you. Good for you. You um, uh, you started as a medical doctor, and you started studying with Indian guru, and suddenly you found yourself on the front lines of kind of global health. Can we can we get into some of that history because it's just it's fascinating how you ended up here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think one goes right from <laughs> scratch to an ashram in the Himalayas. Uh, at least I didn't. I took a circuitous path. Um, when I was in college at the University of Michigan, Martin Luther King came. And uh, I had the privilege of sitting with him on a day that not a lot of people showed up at his talk. And everybody who sat with him uh, was changed by meeting him and understanding what his vision was. Uh, and I marched with him, I was arrested with him, I became a uh, radical doctor. And I came out to San Francisco to do my internship around the time that the Native Americans took over Alcatraz. And uh, John Trudell, who was one of the leaders, and his wife Lou wanted to have a, a baby on Indian liberated land. And that, that sounded cool to me. <laughs> and no doctor was out there, and there was no water and no electricity. So I went out and lived on Alcatraz with Native Americans first. And I delivered this baby named Wavoka. Um, and then um, after the baby was born and I came back uh, in a uh, Coast Guard boat, um, it, it seemed like every television camera on earth was pointed at me as I got off at Pier 42 or something like that. And... Uh, they all wanted to know what the Indians wanted. And I had never met an Indian until three weeks before then. Uh, but I wound up being asked by um, Warner Brothers if I wanted to play a, a doctor in a, what turned out to be terrible rock and roll rock doc movie they were making called Medicine Ball Caravan. And on my first day as a doctor on this uh, caravan for this movie, I met a impossible uh, person named Wavy Gravy. And my first job was to give him a smallpox vaccination because we were going to go to India and come back. And I'd never met anybody like a wavy gravy before. And he's been my best friend for 40 years. And we took a caravan of hippies and we went to India. And that's how we got to India. <laughs> uh, it was two, two psychedelic painted buses going from a Pink Floyd concert in, in London all the way through Afghanistan and Iran into India. So it wasn't exactly you got on an airplane and went there. <laughs> you had an overland voyage back in the good old days uh, to India in hippie buses. That's That was the usual career path for medical students in my day. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I ended up here. <laughs> wow. And you know what's funny is when I was in India, I met uh, a number of expats who took that took that journey and stayed and it was just fascinating to see like you know there was this era that you know was just before my time of people who you know really went there to find spirituality some found it came back some found it came back and did good with it and some just stayed and you know guy was married to an indian wife and had family and it was it was it was amazing to see these hybrid families from the 60s that were still kind of alive and well in that in that culture yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, my wife and I uh, lived on the buses together, and we're still married 47 years later, we, uh, which is improbable. And Wavy and his wife, Ja, are still married almost 50 years, uh, which means that between the two of us couples, we've been married 200 years. 
<laughs> you don't think about that as hippies living on a bus uh, when everybody's sleeping with everybody or when you're living in a monastery where nobody's sleeping with anybody. <laughs> you found the perfect happy medium, actually. <laughs> we did. Yeah, we did. great. So you, go, you, you end up in India. And so you have medical training, which makes you use, a useful hippie, uh, to say the least, right? You have a lot of skills that can be used. And then you show up in, in, in India, which is kind of a shit show. I mean, everyone's sick. There's leprosy everywhere. There's smallpox. There's so much going on. And so then what happens? What, 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 what does the young doctor in you see and what does it spark? Well, there wasn't leprosy everywhere, to be fair. There was leprosy clustered in a few places. Um, there were 200,000 cases of smallpox in uh, 1974 as one example. Uh, I, I, I got started when in 1973, my guru, who we'd been living with, Neem Karoli Baba, um, out of the blue one day, he said that I should leave the ashram, which I, we were really happy there. It was in Nanital. If you look at a map of India and China and Tibet and Nepal, and you put your finger where Nepal and India and Tibet come together, that's where our ashram was. It's in the uh, Kamoan Hills. It's just wonderful. Mm. And I wouldn't have left voluntarily. But out of the blue, he said to me that smallpox is a terrible disease. Of course, I had never seen a case of smallpox. He said it was going to be eradicated. I didn't know what that word really meant. It was in Sanskrit, unmulan, which literally translates as pull out from the roots. And he said that uh, I was going to play a role in that and that he was sending me to go work for the United Nations, which is not all that easy to do, seeing as how I had hair down to the middle of my back and a beard down to my knees. Um, but he kicked me out of the ashram and made me go to the WHO office in New Delhi they, of course, kicked me out of WHO. I was an improbable figure to walk in the doors of a diplomatic office. And then he kept on sending me back five, 10, 15 times until I think maybe they just gave up and created a position low enough to hire me. And I started <laughs> off as a, a clerk. Wow, wow. And all the while knowing that you have been tasked somehow from above or at least from <laughs> from a guru to to have a part in this smallpox play in in the eradication of the uprooting of this disease. Well, the conversation would usually go something like this: I'd meet an American doctor who was a Calvinist or a Methodist, and, and he said, "What are you doing here?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Oh, my guru who lives in the Himalayas said that smallpox is going to be eradicated, and that I'm supposed to come work for." WHO, and I'd say, what do you do? And he'd say, well, I'm the head of the smallpox program from Geneva. We don't have a program yet <laughs> because the Indian government hasn't permitted us to, but it's okay if you hang around for a while. Huh. And I hung around for 10 years. And uh, over the course of those years, they would send me out. When a Russian doctor didn't show up one day, I was, I was sent out to work in a district. And then when another Czech doctor didn't show up, they gave me a state to run. And eventually, um, I was left in charge of the whole program, which was, if you, if you think about leaving a 28-year-old who's never seen smallpox in charge of the whole program, it was a little scary for me and probably scarier for them. <laughs> uh, you know what? That's, that's, that was the state of the world, though, too, right? You have you know, so many people with ailments that we just can't get to fast enough. So, you know, if, if you're, you're in the right position at the right time, you're plugging up that hole. And so you got to grow into it. Well, these were amazing people, Pedro. I mean, uh, D.A. Henderson, who died uh, two weeks ago at 87, who was the global head of the smallpox program, the dean of Johns Hopkins later on, uh, really a redwood tree falling in the forest. He's the first in the great men to die from the smallpox program. And uh, Bill Fagey, who became the head of CDC and then the head of the Carter Center and then advisor to Bill Gates. These are just, these were my mentors. Nicole Grasset, a French doctor who had been running the Pasteur Institutes. Uh, M.I.D. Sharma, uh, an Indian, amazing Indian man who became the Commissioner of Health, Government of India. Isawa Rita, a Japanese doctor. All of them were rewarded the top uh, awards from their own country in the end, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the French Legion of Honor, the Padma Shri, the Japan Prize, 
Um, I was so lucky that this is the group of people who I was tossed in with as uh, the rookie or the just the kid um, uh, to learn from. It's, you know, kind of reminds me, it's like when, when those guys were sitting in Philadelphia signing a Declaration of Independence, did they think, you know, 200 years later that they would be the face of the $20 bill? Did they think yeah. that they would be? Yeah. So, I mean, was it, was it that? Like, was it just a bunch of people jumping in trying to make good things happen and then later on all the recognition came? Absolutely. Uh, you, you know, I, I was 15 years younger than any of them, 20 years, 25 years younger than most of them. Um, and I, I don't know, there's something about the first disease to ever be eradicated that called forth um, entrepreneurs, uh, courageous pilgrims, uh, leaders. Uh, it, it was magical. But <clears throat> if you'd walked into the room, none of them would have said, I'm in charge. You wouldn't have known who was in charge. It was such an egalitarian, respectful environment. And, and I want to say one thing, because we live in a, in a moment in time when there's such racial divisiveness and um, acrimony and uh, vitriol, harsh speech. Um, you know, there were Russians and Americans and Indians. Uh, that if you walked into a room of our meetings, you'd see faces that were every color of the rainbow, every religion, you know, every, uh, 25 different countries in one room at one time. And we worked together as brothers and sisters. Uh, the Russians and the Americans particularly burying in the middle of the Cold War, uh, their nuclear hatchets and fighting together for the same cause instead of at each other's throats. Um, wow. We need more of that. And we need to remember that you can't do that without a functioning United Nations or World Health Organization or global infrastructure. That can't be done by any one strong man or strong woman or strong country. Wow, well, that's a that's a, a very good plug for that global infrastructure because you know there's so many people that hate on the UN and say they haven't done anything right. Uh, and you stand here in testament to the fact that they, you know, they, they organized this party and you know, the, they were able to help orchestrate the eradication of a very nasty disease. Um, how did that play out? Just so I can get a back, background a little bit, like you know, how many years did it take? Like, what does it feel like to eradicate a disease? When do you, when do you know that it's done? Great questions. Well, let's start off with, uh, we know that smallpox was 3,000 years old. We suspect it was 10,000 years old. Mm. Uh, Pharaoh Ramses V had facial scars from smallpox. Um, we suspect it was older than that. Uh, it was probably the most murderous disease in history uh, in the 20th century alone, which was only 17 years ago. <laughs> in the 20th century, uh, smallpox killed half a billion people. That's not a word of, that's 500 million people. That's more than all the wars, all the genocide, all the smallpox killed two dozen kings and queens and emperors. Uh, it's a reminder that no matter how rich you are, no matter how privileged the enclave you live in, you will not survive ahead of your neighbors if there is a virus for which there's no antiviral and no vaccine, as we have had new pandemics emerging it reminds us we're all in it together. So smallpox has a uh, existential metaphysical component to it in my mind because the eradication of it and the elimination of one form of suffering is something noteworthy in human history. And um, I would say that the beginning of that phase of the smallpox program was when a Russian professor of uh, Vladimir Zhdanov came to the UN and the WHO General Assembly and proposed that the world try to eradicate smallpox. It was the fourth disease considered to be eradicated. We'd failed at yellow fever, failed at malaria, failed at uh, yaws. And he said, let's try it again. And the US was a little reluctant and uh, we finally got on board and they decided to task the leadership to an American because they thought it would fail. And they thought that would be interesting. <laughs> uh, and they got DA Henderson and and he was uh, like a football coach. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and he looked like a football coach. And he treated all of us like uh, star athletes. He trusted us. And whatever we did, he would back us up. The n number of times I screwed up is, is legendary. And every time he would, he would back me up. Nicole Grasset, the same. We had this environment that he really let you 
do the best job you could. And if you failed, he said it was his fault because he didn't train you well enough. Mm. Pretty good mag- leadership. Magical. So the first, um, the first few years were very difficult because the strategy, which was really created by Bill Fagey, the strategy was not to vaccinate everybody, which is what intuitively you think of, let's vaccinate everybody. But if you've got an outbreak of smallpox in Newark, New Jersey, it does not help to vaccinate people in Tokyo. You have mm-hmm. to vaccinate where the disease is. Mm-hmm. That means you have to find every case. And uh, you know India. Uh, <laughs> India uh, suppressed every case of smallpox. Uh, smallpox was, in some quarters, considered the visitation of a goddess, Shitlama, the cooling mother. Mm. And so people didn't report smallpox. And why bother to report it? There was no medicine that would help. There was no way to ease the suffering. Uh, people doubted the vaccine was um, effective. Of course, it was very effective. But he decided that the most moral thing to do was to vaccinate people who were living near a case of smallpox. And we embarked upon the largest search campaign in history. We visited every house in India every month for 20 months. We made 2 billion house calls trying to find every case. And when I say we, I mean 150,000 search workers that came from the government of India, the states of India, WHO, the countries that have participated. Wow. And every time we knocked on the door, we showed a picture of a child that had smallpox. And we said, is there any case like this here? And we would find them. We would offer rewards. We would bring elephants. And I occasionally would bring an airplane and drop leaflets, get myself into trouble. Uh, But we found every case. And we put a ring of immunity around every single case. It took us several years. And then even after the last case, who was a little girl named Rahima Banu, in Kuralia village in Patwakali province in the Bay of Bengal on Bola Island, even after her case, we still kept vaccinating and searching for an extra 24 months Mm. to be sure we hadn't missed anything. But I want to say one thing about this little girl. When she coughed and the viruses that she had in her fell on the dirt of the island of Bola in Bangladesh, They were cooked by the sun and they died. And there was no susceptible person left who was unvaccinated for the virus to go. And when that happened, then a chain of transmission, unbroken chain of transmission, going back to Pharaoh Ramses V, was broken. And this kind of smallpox, the killer smallpox, variola major, became extinct. Wow. And I, I write about that in my book because when that happened, I was there or I was there shortly thereafter, a couple of weeks after that. And it was like, you, you immediately knew that something magical had happened at that place. That this one horrible way for children to die would never happen again. Parents would never worry that their child would be killed by this terrible disease again. You knew wow. that something had happened that was historic, mystical, scientifically amazing was that's what i think about when i think you ask what does it feel like to be part of an eradication program i feel like how i felt when i sat in front of this little girl awed by what had just happened was your guru still alive at this moment no he died uh only several months after he sent me to work for the smallpox program in those few months every weekend we would go my wife and i would i would work in new delhi and then in the weekend, I would go up to Nanital and go to the ashram, and he would say, well, how is it? How's the smallpox program going? Are you done yet? <laughs> what's taking so long? Say, yeah, what's taking so long? And then uh, I would get depressed because I had seen so many children dying, and he would have me read a shloka from the Bhagavad Gita or something from the Ramayana or the Dhammapada or the Bible, and then I would come back uh, the next week, and I would recite what I had read, and he would help me walk through the meaning of non-attachment, of not putting my name up there in lights, of not being attached to name and fame. And um, at the same time, he would say, by the way, you know, smallpox really occurs mostly in the springtime. And you have to be very careful about the holy cities because people will come to the holy cities on pilgrimage, but they'll really bring smallpox, so be careful. Wow, so he knew a thing or two. He was he was very dialed in. 
he was really dialed in. In fact, there's never been two words better spoken about Neem Curly Baba than he was dialed in. <laughs> so then what happens to a young Larry Brilliant when this moment happens and you have this kind of catharsis of like, holy cow, we did it. And you had been, you know, you just kind of took orders and went off um, and, and, you know, this became your life. And now what? You've hatched this egg. Now, now where do you go? Like, did you get lost or did you find newfound direction? Boy, that is the big question. And that's, that's the question that I get asked by people who haven't had a guru. Because mm -hmm. in a way, we're, we're in the same boat. I, it was so much easier for me when I had someone I respected so much. And I didn't know who he was. I mean, I don't know if, if he was an avatar or bodhisattva. I mean, these are big words, you know. Yeah. But whatever he was, it was enough for me. And when he said that God would help lift one form of suffering from the shoulders of humanity, of course I was incredulous and skeptical. And then when it happened, hmm. I was smitten. And, and so I wanted to do it again. I wanted to do it again. I mean, if you get a little endorphin hit or a little dopamine hit every time Facebook sends you a notice that somebody's called, <laughs> how would it be if your guru called? I wanted that dopamine again. I wanted to climb another mountain. And a lot of us did, a lot of the people who worked in small pups. A after we'd gone back to our institutions and rejoiced and then got tired and then you know, did whatever we did and got bored. We wanted that again. And so uh, a group of us came together uh, and we formed the Seva Foundation uh, and we decided that we would try to tackle blindness. Now, this was a slightly different group. Uh, the group that worked at WHO were all professors of epidemiology and they all had PhDs. But uh, the people that I started Seva with, we, we wanted to have that dopamine hit that high uh, we wanted that available to people who didn't have PhDs or wouldn't have qualified to be a professor of epidemiology. And Nicole Grasset, who had been my boss in the smallpox program, she said that we were starting the Hippie Red Cross. She was a very improbable candidate to start the Hippie Red Cross. But uh, but I opened up a Rolodex that included Ram Dass and the people who had lived at my ashram, uh, uh, Steve Jobs, who had lived at my ashram, and uh, Wavy Gravy and my friends from the hog farm and the Grateful Dead, of course, and, um, and then all the smallpox epidemiologists and CDC doctors and WHO doctors and ophthalmologists. And so SEVA was a very unusual NGO, non-governmental organization and foundation, at a time when there weren't too many. Uh, we weren't exactly the Hippie Red Cross, but we certainly weren't exactly the United Nations either. And how did it go? Uh, what happened? Like, you know, is, it's you, you, trying to recreate a win is a tough one, right? And that's, you know, the Buddhists would say, you know, that, that happened yesterday, so don't go after the same experience. Um, how did that roll out? Was it, was it disappointing? Was it amazing? Heraclitus said that the river you dip your cup into today is different than the river you dipped your cup into yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. And that was even more true, I think. Um, well, I'll let you be the judge. Um, since SEVA was started in 1979, our programs and projects and partners have given back sight to more than 4 million blind people. And almost all of that has been for free. Uh, we just did a film called Open Your Eyes, which is on HBO right now, in fact, um, about a, a couple, two of the blind people who were given back their sight in Nepal. Um, but 4 million is a big number. Now, we, we wouldn't have been able to do that without one incredible man, Dr. G. Venkateswamy, a long name. We called him Dr. V, who was at our first board meeting, one of the founders of SEVA. He started the Aravind Eye Hospital in Tamil Nadu. Uh, they've done half to two-thirds of all those surgeries, and they do them three-quarters for free. It, it's an amazing institution. It is now the largest and the finest eye hospital in the world. But when Seva was started, they had only 13 beds. Mm. And Seva and Aravind became, I mean, it started off that Seva was the foundation, Aravind was the hospital, but you, our families came together. Uh, the families at Aravind became close to Neem Kuroli Baba, the Neem Kuroli Baba, and smallpox families. I mean, they're, they became pretty much the same big family. But it's due to Aravind 
and to the love that they had for their guru, uh, the mother and Sri Aurobindo uh, from Pondicherry. Actually, Aurobind is a name which means dawn in Tamil, but it also is an homage to Aurobindo. And our two communities have come together. I, I think that getting rid of smallpox as well as getting rid of blindness has a spiritual component, certainly blindness, uh, because vision has this double entendre mm. when you're talking about physical and spiritual vision. And it certainly has always felt like that working on the blindness program. And so it, you, you can judge if it's been successful. Um, I think SEVA has raised uh, over $300 million that have been given to blindness organizations. Um, I think we had about uh, 15 or 20 uh, Grateful Dead concerts to raise money. And whether it was Bonnie Raitt or Jackson Brown or David Crosby and Graham Nash, or Steve Roy, you name it, uh, Joan Baez, everybody's done concerts to help us raise money. Now, that wouldn't have happened if we'd all been professors of epidemiology. We had Wavy Gravy to uh, be our uh, clown prince. <laughs> you have had an incredible life hanging out with some Is it over? People. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's it. From here on in, it's boring. You're gonna play golf. <laughs> I do play golf. Ah, excellent. It's still, see, it's still not over. Um, I'm not good enough to make golf boring. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I usually wait for the drink cart. Um, <laughs> so you've met all these amazing people along the way, and uh, it's not like you've stopped. You're still doing all kinds of stuff. So what are you up to? Like, what do you do with your days now? Well, I, I spent the last 18 months finishing this book. Um, the, the publishers gave it the name Sometimes Brilliant. <laughs> uh, if you open up to the second page, it says Other Times Not So, or Sometimes <laughs> Not So, which I think is a better description of the book. Um, and uh, the, I don't know, the, the idea of it was to cover 10 years from the moment that uh, I met Martin Luther King to the end of smallpox. Um, meeting Wavy, meeting Ramdas, meeting Neem Kroli Baba, and, and studying with the, the Karmapa, who, after Maharaji died, uh, adopted us spiritually. This Tibetan uh, Rinpoche, this amazing, wonderful man, we went to Room Tech in Sikkim and studied with him and spent a lot of time with him. Uh, but a, a succession of gurus and wise people that I have been blessed to meet. Um, so that, that's what the book covers. My life, of course, continued on. <laughs> and uh, I wound up at Google as a vice president and head of Google Philanthropy, Google.org. And uh, then I moved to work with Jeff Skoll and the Skoll Foundation. And we started something called Skoll Global Threats Fund, which I'm currently chairman of. I retired as CEO. And uh, we work on pandemics and climate change, water, Middle East, nuclear weapons. Uh, the difference in Google, Google tries to take everything to scale at global threats. We try to stop global threats. We don't try to take them to scale. <laughs> What's that like? Is, is, that, uh, is that exhilarating? Is it depressing? I mean, you're dealing with some big stuff. But you've, de you've dealt with big stuff before. So how do you go, like, what's the mindset going in saying, let's fix the Middle East? Oh, you know, I, th there's depressing on a uh, ontological or epistemological big picture level. Uh, but there's nothing more depressing uh, than going into a town, Tatanagar, which I did in the smallpox program, and go to the railway station and find bodies stacked like cords of wood and children dying right on the railway tracks and rumors of vultures and birds of prey pecking at them. I mean, there's nothing. It, it, I, I once walked into uh, several weeks of a Hieronymus Bosch painting or Dante's Inferno. And that's when your faith in God gets challenged. And that's when you're it, me, in my case, my faith in my guru and my mission and my life. That's the most, um, Working on the big picture is easier in some ways than if you if you have a loss in your family, a child dies, or if you lose a parent. Um, those are 
you, you asked, is it, is it more challenging? Those are in some ways more challenging. In some ways, working in a big foundation and helping to deal with these big problems, you, you get some degree of emotional distance. Maybe that's not true for climate change because it's such a c catastrophic change in the world. And it's invisible, it's odorless, it's tasteless. And when you know that it's real and you have idiots who run for president who say it's not real, it, it's, that's, that's a different kind of frustration. Mm. It's, 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 you, you can see what will happen to our children and our grandchildren if we don't fix it now. A pandemic, when a pandemic happens and even stopping a pandemic, now that we've, we've had a little uh, boutique taste of Ebola and Zika, Mm. It's easy to make people aware that a pandemic can bring humanity to its knees. It's very hard to persuade them that climate change can bring humanity to its knees. But it is bringing yeah. our world to its knees. And uh, so it's it's doubly frustrating. Uh, even though I may have seen thousands of children die of smallpox, climate change can be much worse if we leave it unabated. And because it takes a long time to happen because you don't it's not in your face every day it's easy to pretend that it's not happening but it is happening so when you were dealing with smallpox you guys looked at the epidemiology you looked at the vectors of transmission you isolated where the bug was and you know basically made it so that it wouldn't transmit and get to further you know people and you vaccinated all around it you know whatever you, you had a plan you you executed on that plan and it worked is there, like, do you guys at the Skoll Foundation, do you guys actually have a plan that you're rolling out for climate change that's as, as kind of clear and articulate? Or is that part of the challenge with this? Because there's so many variables and so many, you know, like China, like get them to, get them to cooperate, you know? So, so how, does that, how does that play out? Oh, you're, you're, you're right on. I mean, um, well, I think we have a pretty good plan for pandemics. Um, I think that we've put together a team and worked on plans to build collateral organizations in the event that WHO is unable to do everything that's necessary to prevent or curtail a pandemic. Um, it's an alphabet soup of organizations, Gorn and Cords and Tevinad, and I, I can name a lot of others. And, and those names will put you to sleep. But these are really good organizations. Um, the UN and all of the post- Second World War, Bretton Woods-like organizations have grown long in the tooth. Uh, they were fit for purpose after we all saw the horror of the genocide and the camps in the Second World War. We were willing to give up a little sovereignty and give up a little money and come together. Um, absent a catastrophic event like that, the world has been subject to many centrifugal forces, not centripetal forces that bring you together. And so those agencies, which depend upon the money and the goodwill of 200 nations, they, they're, they're struggling right now. As China arises, Russia has its own ideas, India is reaching a level that it hasn't had before, and America is going through our transitions, whatever those may be. Uh, so these non-governmental organizations, these NGOs, foundations, uh, one in particular, CORDS, is comprised of 27 countries, four UN agencies and four big foundations, and then lots of other groups like CDC and uh, USAID and things like that. Um, though, so I think we have a plan for pandemics, as difficult as pandemics are, and Zika is really a game changer. I mean, we could have an entire conversation about what it means that a mosquito carries a packet of genetic material that can go and infect person to person and sexually transmitted and cause birth defects, what that means epidemiologically or even what does it mean to, to our, our hearts. Uh, but I, I'm more confident that we have a handle on pandemics than I am on climate change because there's so many lies. Pandemics doesn't have an organized lobby in opposition to it denying its existence. <laughs> the Zika, the Zika change, lobby said it didn't happen. There's no yeah. Zika lobby that's, that's no. there saying, I want more mosquitoes, let them bite more pregnant women. That doesn't happen. Mm. But in climate change, you have exactly that ridiculous situation where uh, the coal industry and the fossil fuel industry and Koch brothers and people who 
benefit from the current fossil fuel regime uh, are able to uh, produce lies. Uh, Jeff Skoll is the producer of a movie called Merchants of Doubt, which is a film about scientists who were paid to deny cigarettes were linked to cancer. Now these same scientists have been paid to deny that fossil fuels are linked to climate change. I don't mean the same kind of scientists. I mean the same human beings. Same guys. Again. Wow. They have their horse so, squad. Yeah, these are tough things to think yeah. about. Um, and, but I encourage people to watch Merchants of Doubt. It's, it gives you some insight into that world. And there are some courageous Republicans like Bob Inglis. And not very many, I have to admit, who are um, trying to fight for ways to deal with climate change. So I think climate change, by its nature, is the most complex of the multi-generational, multinational, multi-factorial uh, um, problems that we face. So you've obviously got a lot of gas left in the tank. Um, you've got vitality, you are uh, full of energy, and you're, you're, you're super sharp. And so where do you, do you have like a direction where you're like, you know what, this is where I want to go next? Are you waiting for, you know, are you waiting for revelation or do you got a plan? So, so, so first, I think you should talk to my children before you have so much confidence in all those nice adjectives <laughs> that you just used. Um, thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, you know, uh, I remain convinced that humanity, when united, can deal with all the problems that we face. Uh, you can't. You can't sit in front of of Rahima Banu and witness the end of transmission of a disease like smallpox and not emerge from it an optimist. So I'm an optimist. I think we can fix climate change. We can abate its effects. I think we can stop pandemics in our lifetime or maybe the lifetime of the youngest person watching this podcast. <laughs> hmm. I think that we can deal with water and its myriad issues of scarcity and uh, flood. Uh, I think that we can deal with regional conflagrations like the Middle East that explode with the potential for nuclear war. And there's a long list of new technological weaponry that began with nuclear weapons, but certainly include cyber and biological weapons. And to some extent, the cyber weapons and the biological weapons are more pernicious. And we have less agreement on how pernicious they are. So, so these are not to minimize any of these threats or make light of them or the economic threats or the threat of uh, economic disparity or income inequality or racial tension or any of the problems that we are beset with as a byproduct of modernity and globalization and selfishness and greed. But we could solve all those. We don't need money. We don't need technology. We only need one thing and that's will. We had a public will to eradicate smallpox. It was so awful on its face. Watching children die from it was so horrible. Everyone felt so personally vulnerable to losing someone. Or even if you were thinking in great global terms, you had a historical perspective of how evil this disease was. We were able to put aside our differences and come together. And we developed public will and from that came the money and the people, and that's what's missing today. We need a, a public will to cure the problems that we have. I, I say that pandemics are not inevitable. Outbreaks are inevitable. Pandemics are optional, but human beings have to exercise our option to put the resources in to stop it. That's true for almost all of these global threats. They're not inevitable. It's optional if we want to succumb to them. But we don't have to succumb to them if we have the public will to combat them and if we understand that we are all in this together. Don't let people lie to you and divide you and pretend that it's one group versus another. Use the example of smallpox. We are all in this together. If we believe that, if we understand that, and if we have the will, 
there's no problem that's facing humanity that we cannot overcome. I love that. Now, there's the notion of the kind of splintered attention of humanity. You know, whether you're what? watching, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether you're watching CNN or MSNBC or Fox or one of these things, you know, people are kind of in their own camps with the type of flavor of information they get, or they're just watching the Kardashians and are dumbing down. And so, how? can we keep our attention on what's important and not get overwhelmed, which is what I kind of, I get a lot from the, the sentiment on the internet is like, you know, there's so much doom and gloom that I'd rather just play Minecraft. And, and that doesn't seem to serve humanity. So how, how, can, how can people snap out of that? It's difficult. These are what in law are called attractive nuisances. <laughs> and they're very attractive. <clears throat> and all of us are beguiled by technology, and all of us who can be, uh, are beguiled by it. it and, and it is pretty amazing. Uh, having been at Google for quite a while, uh, there is certainly a part of me which loves technology. And, you know, uh, if you watch Steve Jobs when he was pitching an iPhone, you were inside of that iPhone by the time he finished, and then it was inside of you. Um, and th none of these are necessarily bad things. But we have to put them to the use of solving the biggest problems in the world. I'm not an advocate of discarding technology. I actually have a, a faith that technology, which I could draw up a list of all the bad things about modernity and technology and all the good things. And I think the good things have an edge on the bad ones as long as we have the intentionality to use them for making the world a better place. Look, look I, Gandhi was once asked, this question, how do we know that what we're doing is good or how do we judge a, an innovation or a society? And he said, you need a magic amulet to be able to judge whether something is good or not, a talisman. So I will give you a talisman, an amulet. Here it is. Before you judge anybody, before you judge an act, before you judge what you're going to do, Consider if what you're going to do will benefit the poorest, the most vulnerable, the most disenfranchised person you've ever met. A homeless person, perhaps. Somebody of a different color, living in a different place. Consider if the act that you are about to do will benefit that person. And if it will, the amulet will protect you. The act of doing good to the least amongst us will protect you from making a mistake. And that's, we don't remember that, Pedram. We don't remember that. Society doesn't remember, individuals don't remember, that before you consider what you do, think about what you learned in Sunday school or what your parents taught you or what you have some vestigial memory of from someone you met who had a light in their eyes and a sparkle in their smile and Ask what they would have done and how you could judge how you're going to spend your time, what career you're going to take. When I came back from the eradication of smallpox, I was a professor at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Makes me smile just to think about Ann Arbor. And, and it was 10 years that kids would say, I'm not going to go into law, I'm not going to go into business, I want to go into public health. My God, they eradicated smallpox. Mm. We need more things like that. We need we need victories over other of these great problems so that the next generation of kids can say, I want to do that. I love that. I love that. We, uh, a generation of kids wanted to become astronauts because we did that. And a generation right. wanted to be doctors because of the work you and your, your colleagues did and um, you know, amongst many others. So, Larry, uh, we're, we're out of time and, and that makes me sad because I, I freaking love this. You are so <laughs> fun. Uh, listen, I'm a big fan of your work. I think that everyone listening to this needs to get out and read this book right now. It's called Sometimes Brilliant by Larry Brilliant. I'm going to put it right there. Uh, and um, man, I think that this is, uh, you, you are an inspiration and it's because you stepped in and did it. And we can all do that, right? And so that's the, the to be a role model means to just step in and do the work. And you, you did it and you continue to do it and you've inspired me. I uh, can't wait to get through your book. Uh, you know, I skimmed it, but now I'm gonna read it cover to cover because it's, uh, you know, 
it's reflective of this magical journey that you took. And I think that every single one of us has a journey like that in us. We just have to get out of our own way. So uh, the book can be found, I'm assuming, everywhere books are sold. Yep. Excellent. Well, I've been told that too. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Larry, this, is, this has been an honor and a privilege. I, I'm glad to have had you on the show, and I, and I thank you for your time. Pedro, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I've never been called frickin' fun. And with your permission, I'm going to tell my children that I am frickin' fun, even if it doesn't feel like it to them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, permission granted. Go get them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and good luck to well.org and to all the things that you're doing. Uh, this is a wonderful venue. I really appreciate being invited on. Yeah, thank you.